Good evening, folks. Good afternoon, whatever it is. I have the dubious honor of having the last talk of the show, and I'm glad to see there's still a couple of us around. Um, before I start, though, uh, for those of you that were at the banquet last night, I am going to make another appeal. I apologize for that if, um, if this doesn't agree with a lot of people, but this, this effort that we're trying to do with PJAC is very, very important. And uh, so far today, at our booth alone, um, people have come up and, and generous donations, modest donations, it doesn't matter. We've been able to collect 3500 bucks at our booth, and there's a lot of other uh, monies coming in from everywhere. So I'm just happy to say that the industry is supporting this initiative. And uh, you guys, if you've already given, uh, you know, I applaud you. And uh, if you haven't, we have signs here that you can fill up. I realized last night if I would have asked everybody in the audience for 10 bucks, we could have got 16,000 bucks right there. So anything you can do to help, it would be greatly appreciated. So to move on, um, and right after the talk, I've got them right here on the table if you want one. And moving on, um, you know, over the years, a lot of people have asked me, what's it like to live in Fiji? Uh, you live in paradise. Uh, it's a dream life and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yes and no. Okay, there's a lot of um, positives about living in the South Pacific, of course, uh, but you, you got to remember uh, what I'm going to show you here is what it takes to have a business, both business. My wife, Deborah, uh, was an interior designer with her own studio, and I had my, my wholesale business in L.A. Uh, I'm, and doing very well, both of us, and uh, we decided to just pick up everything leave the cars behind, get rid of the house, and move to a grass hut. So that's pretty much how it starts. And so I'll take you on my journey, and you'll see some of the good and some of the bad, what it takes to uh, live in the third world country with, when all the governments are different, and uh, all the rules are different, and you have to learn to adapt to uh, you know, other customs and other ways of life. So as I say, welcome to my journey, following the sun. Now, like I said, uh, I began my career in L.A. in this business um, in 1972. And uh, for 16 years, I was in L.A. as a wholesaler supplying retail stores around the country. And this was my modest little facility um, just outside of Los Angeles. During all this time, my wife, Deb, was working um, in her business. And um, somewhere along the... And what I, what I did a lot was I exported... Um, I, I went to Miami and bought... Caribbean fish, and I exported them to the Orient. And somewhere along the line, uh, one of the people that I was dealing with says, you know, there's this new guy in Tonga. He doesn't really know what he's doing, but he's got good fish. Why don't you get an order from him? So I did. And although the fish were beautiful, they were dead. And it was kind of disheartening to see all these beautiful fish come in. The guy was uh, new in the business, really didn't know, you know a lot about it. So we decided to make a trip to Tonga and uh, my wife and I and, and a good friend of mine who owned a retail store in St. Louis went down as a joint vacation, um, as a working vacation to help this guy and teach him how to sh uh, ship fish so that I can get fish alive. Now, Tong is, uh, has three major island groups, but you can only work out of one of them because there's only one airport. And uh, so our main group was uh, Nukalofa. And as you can see, yes, it's paradise. This is in 1989. And um, so, like I said, my wife still had her business and we were doing well in, in, in L.A. But uh, when my, my dream, I moved from Chicago to California because I wanted to be near the ocean. And I said, if I ever make another move, it's going to be tropical. And as you can see, it was. Downtown Nukalofa wasn't much to talk about. Uh, actually, when we arrived there, we, you could find horse and carts coming down the street. So, of course, they invited us over for dinner. And... Uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, this is a pretty typical dinner, what you would have in Tonga. They call that the bola. And uh, they lay out uh, pieces of pig and fruit and everything on these long palm leaves. And everybody sits on the ground and has a feast. So in the beginning, everything looked wonderful. I was there for three days. And I said to my wife, we're moving here. Because the guy said, what I really need is a working partner. But I didn't realize I had this stuff to deal with. And, you know, um, this is the royal family. 
there's the princess, Princess Pulaliva, and she's walking down the street in her everyday clothes. And um, you look around and you go, where in the hell am I? I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere. And I want to start a, a, a business. What? I want to go out on the reef and catch little fish. But um, in the meantime, my wife is now back in L.A. And I'm telling her, yes, I'm serious. We're going to move here. We're going to take everything that we, that we now know, pack it up in boxes, and we're going to move out of our home and move from that to this. And this was our first home in Tonga. Now, it's a modest home. It's about maybe 100 yards from the beach. So it wasn't all that bad. Yes, it was paradise. And I went back to L.A. and broke all of this down, and I shipped it to Tonga. Well, at this point, my wife is saying, all right, I'm, I need to stay here. And I became a commuter back and forth to Tonga. And uh, now I'm alone for a year while she's taking care of her affairs and closing the business down. And what do you do when you're alone for a year and your wife isn't around? Well, <laughs> need I say more? Anyway, all of my stuff started to arrive. My wife is uh, organizing her, her affairs in, in, uh, in L.A., getting ready to come down and join me. And we had a pact where either every six weeks she would come and see me or I would fly back to L.A. It worked out pretty handy because there was always stuff that needed to be transferred back and, transported back and forth. So I wound up getting a, a little larger warehouse than you saw in that first photo, but it really wound up just being a big storeroom. I had no parts, no, no way to build my first system. And it's slow. And so what, what we were able to do before we had water running is uh, we started out by shipping anemones. That was easy enough. Um, they didn't need to be held in a system. They could be pretty much packed the next day after you shipped them or t you know, caught them. So we kept them in buckets full of water. And eventually, slowly but surely, I started to build the fish system that I had moved from LA. Well, we didn't really have any fish catchers yet. And the reason I really wanted to move to Tonga is because being a wholesaler in L.A. for so many years and the coral business hadn't really started yet. The only thing you can get in those years was Ganapora from Indonesia. That was it. So I was swimming around in Tonga and I said, look at all this beautiful stuff in the water. You know, we could start a business on the coral because just then wet dry filters were coming on the market. Things were happening. Tech, tech, you know, technology was becoming available to keep corals alive. So in my fish system, I was keeping coral. Now my wife is moving out of her house. Her friends came over. Um, house is empty, ready to be taken over. She's saying goodbye to her father. All of our stuff is packed in the, uh, all of our personal effects are packed in a container. And Deborah is about to change her life forever. So while all that was going on, we kept building more and more of the fish system that we had moved from L.A., and uh, still, all we have is coral in the fish system, which was kind of silly. But uh, that's all we had. It's the only place we had to keep, keep the, the live product that we were selling. Slowly but surely, we were training divers in Tonga to catch fish because we didn't want to use the same divers that were there uh, killing all the fish when, before I got there. And as you see, the, the collection was uh, pretty modest in the beginning. Uh, here, you, here you see we were collecting clams and fish and whatever we could all at the same time. And uh, we started to build slowly an invert system because we knew we, would, we could not keep the corals and the fish together. So now we needed two separate si systems. And as, the, as time went on, that system got bigger to the point where we decided we needed to take the back of the warehouse and make it nothing but corals. Now corals are coming on the market, and you're now getting your red lobophilias, you're getting your yellow leathers, you're getting your purple mushroom, uh, you're getting your lavender rock, all of that stuff first came from Tonga. A lot of it my, my wife and I named because there wasn't a name for it yet. It didn't exist in the industry. Lavender rock was just something that was purple. Um, candy coral to me looked like a Christmas, Christmas candy that I used to get when I was a kid. You know, the Colostrea. My friend Gary, uh, who made the first trip with me to Tonga with his family, um, became my working partner and he spent about, he came down about 20 different times because he was my carpenter, my plumber, my electrician. He is a professional electrician. So him back and forth and building this slowly, but every time Gary came down, they called him Cyclone Gary because he'd work for two weeks and the whole system would be built. Uh, so eventually the warehouse started taking place. Now we're able to ship all of the product that was needed, uh, you know, uh, both fish and, and coral, soft corals and hard corals out of Tonga. 
and that meant we had to build two separate packing systems. Um, the, this was the, the, the fish system up in front with its own shipping water and the coral system in back with its own shipping water. Why? Because it needed separate pHs and separate salinities and things, you know, a lot of requirements to export animals for that long of a time. Of course, we had all of the, the, the necessary, you know, bio towers, protein skimmers, and one of the best crew in the world. The only problem is they had a little bit of a dress, dress code problem. So finally, when we started organizing and getting, and getting more and more professional, um, we went from a, a three-man company, well, two, two men and a woman, uh, my wife and, and myself, and that guy in the black t-shirt you see all the way there on, the, on your right um, was, was the three-man company that started out uh, Walt Smith International in Tonga. Um, our first collecting boat was nothing to speak of. However, that little thing with the 30 horsepower uh, motor on it scared the living daylights out of me. I had never dr driven a boat before. And uh, this was, everything for me was new. I'm a, you know, I'm a city boy and now I'm living on an island. Um, there's me and, and my man Dickie uh, getting ready to go out on a collecting trip. This is how we did it. We had the uh, large buckets with inner tubes around them and all the product went in there. It floated on the water and, and, and the buckets were filled with holes so there was a lot of circulation for the product. And you saw that little boat, well, sometimes it became problematic to anchor that boat up because this is what you see in Tonga all the time on the reef. The reef um, is just a couple hundred meters offshore and after that it just goes into deep sea. So this is what we re encountered many, many times as we tried to anchor up our boat and, and, and go collect the product we were looking for. Water wasn't that easy to come by in Tonga. Um, this is how we did it. We drove our truck, our, the, we called the truck the Google Muck, and uh, Google Muck would go to the, uh, the pier in town and we'd hand bucket the, the water up to the barrel that we kept on the back of the truck and you saw the truck wasn't in that great of shape. Um, when we got back to the warehouse we would pump it through a, a lifeguard filter system and into the tanks and we tried to keep the water as pure as possible. However, um, this would happen about once a week. Sometimes while we're at the wharf, the truck would just break in half. So, you know, yeah, it's paradise, you know. <laughs> Everything's so easy. You got the sun and the palm trees and you got rusty trucks that break in half. And now we're in the process of moving our family and getting, you know, our, our two daughters. Um, our oldest daughter is Kaylin. You may know the name Kaylini Rock. That's where the name came from. This is our youngest daughter, Buna. And... Now they're in school. And you can see customs are a little different. The class, classroom is made up of um, some white expat that were down there on family postings or whatever. They would work at the bank or the insurance company or whatever. And the rest of it was mostly local, local kids that could afford a private school. And then again, we got this stuff to deal with. The royal family rules Tonga. You can't get anything done without them. They have um, absolute power. And when I say the royal family, it's, it's an extended family uh, of, of many um, royals, uh, prime ministers, whatever, uh, friends of the family that get appointed to great jobs for life. And they decide what it is you're able to do. Now, I was in Tonga for a full year before I got my permit to operate. So I would have to go see Mr. Red Velvet Cape every week just to get a, a permit signed so I could ship that next week. And it wasn't until a year later I finally got my, my, my official um, business license to operate in Tonga permanently. And now we're able to start moving on after, after we got our license and, and more and more export became available. As that became available, we were able to afford more things and expand the company a little bit. This is the uh, boat that we came all the way back to California to buy to ship down there because you can't really buy boats of any quality there and we were so proud of that thing. Uh, so all the crews on there celebrating, when, you know, we're toasting our, our new boat. And uh, we, we finally got up to a couple of boats, and these are the divers. This is how it goes. You go down to the wharf in the morning, you load it up with the buckets, and you go out and you catch your fish and your coral and come back to the warehouse. Of course, everybody sort of got into the act. We had, um, I, I, I participated in child labor, I'm sorry. My, uh, my, these were our Spanish dancer collectors. Now, Spanish dancers, I don't know if you know this or not, are, are found in little tide pools. And uh, my daughter, uh, Kaylini and, and, and Buna, 
uh, would go down to the tide pools and they would find hundreds of Spanish dancers all over the place. The problem is we only sold about three or four a week, but they had a lot of fun. But we live in paradise. So you got that going on where you can take Sundays off and go enjoy yourself, and then all week long you got hassles. And of course, we live in paradise. And sometimes paradise has cyclones. And what happens with a cyclone? Well, your boats sink. You have a lot of problems. Your engines are underwater. Um, you're pretty much out of business for three or four weeks up to a month. The product in the water really sucks because all the acroporas have been kicked around and it takes a long recovery time after a, after a cyclone. You know, my customers say, Walt, you know, where's the product? I say, well, we just had a cyclone. Well, you know, that was last week. Well, we live in paradise and this is what you see. And when you don't eat for a month, you know, things happen. <laughs> I'm sure my wife is really not happy I put that up there. <laughs> anyway, then came along, a friend of mine came to Tong, I think it was Gary, and then one of my customers said, you know, you really ought to be, you know, doing live rock. And I said, what's live rock? And we went out and we collected this rock, and he said, that's live rock. And I said, that's like selling real estate. You know, I want to sell fish and coral, you know, I don't want to do rock. And I resisted for about a year, but the live rock was beautiful. And right about that time, um, the U.S. government banned the live rock collection in Florida. So the world was hungry for live rock. So we said, okay, I'll, I'll experiment. I'll try different types. This is the Buna branch or Tonga red branch, whatever, whatever you guys know it by in the industry. And uh, we were the first ones to export li live rock out of the South Pacific. And our exports started to grow based on the live rock export. And now things are going along pretty well, and Tong is looking good. And we're able to ship large shipments, whatever we could fit on the small airplanes that were down there. Remember that you're always dependent on, you know, whatever air travel you have. In Tonga, we had one shipment, one air flight a week, and it went through Samoa. Uh, in the very beginning, it went through Hawaii. So right around this time, this is about 1994, 95, um, we had a workshop in Tonga, and the region, Samoa, Vanuatu, Tahiti, uh, Cook Islands, had a workshop at the fisheries, and, um, the, and the, uh, we also had a visit from local, our, our overseas customers, and this is the Prime Minister of Tonga, and now they're recognizing us as a valuable export to the economy of Tonga. And during that um, workshop, the one of the uh, head guys at fisheries in Fiji came up to me and he says, you know, um, I like the tour in your facility. Um, I think you need, I, I would like you to come to Fiji and see what you can do about opening up a company there because the uh, export, uh, the, it's an emerging uh, business in Fiji and we would like to have you set a prime, you know, an example. Um, there wasn't really any exporters there uh, except for one who had been there for many years and, and probably my, till, till this day, my idol in fish collection. He's one of the best people in the world and he's speaking at Next Macna, Tony Nahaki. But other than Tony, um, there was nobody else in Fiji and Tony didn't do coral and he didn't do rock. So we went over to Tonga. This is our, um, after we went to Tonga and, and, we, and we did some surveys and we decided that there was a lot of um, product there that we could do and guess what? There's flights almost every day on a 747. Uh, that, that opened the doors for more export. So this is our last dinner in Tonga before we moved to Fiji. And we got to Fiji and we found this. Of course, we live in paradise. So here's a warehouse, much better than anything you'd see in Tonga. And uh, we started to develop this warehouse. Uh, this was a boat manufacturer when, when we took over, the, took over the building. Of course, we're in the South Pacific and you can't buy a lot of things. When I moved to Tonga, I had the advantage of moving my system from LA to Tonga so everything was already built. But in Fiji, we had to start from scratch. So we decided the best way to make money and create revenue quickly would be to start with Live Rock. So this is the world's first Live Rock holding system. And uh, we, we also had to build the building around it uh, because I didn't want to put it inside the warehouse because I was saving that for fish. So as we went, uh, we put the reservoirs um, 
you know, we put all the plumbing in the ground because I don't like walking over pipes and creating a hazard for our, uh, for our employees. So those are the first reservoirs behind the rock system. And uh, we were going to put the first coral system right next to it. So that's how the, the business and the building started to develop. That yellow building you see in the background was our first building, but everything else we had to build as we went. And now the rock system is finally in operation and we're creating revenue. Um, this is how we kept live rock in those days. It was spray bars. And um, we, we, we learned really quickly that if you tried to submerge the freshly caught rock in water, you just wound up with an ammonia situation you couldn't deal with. By gassing it off with, with spray bars, the rock kept nice and fresh and pretty, and we, and we were able to ship it. And it didn't stink like low tide when you received it. And for those of you that have been in the hobby for more than 12 years, you know what live rock looks like. The rest of you do not. This is live rock. What you see for the last 12 years has been shipped by boat. And you're hearing it from the source. And the, the wholesalers think that's good enough. And this is how, this is how the industry has uh, de developed and, and evolved. Uh, they still say it's live rock, but it doesn't look like this. So whenever we can convince one of our wholesalers to fly it in by air like it should be, um, you can have the rock in two days in your tanks, or you can wait a month or more to get it by boat. So I'm just giving you a chance to see what you might be missing. And uh, in the beginning, our first order of live rock was 400 boxes. So we were very, very excited. We thought we had really done well. We made the right decision to move to Fiji, and uh, it worked well. So as the live rock provided funds to continue to grow our facility, because I'm not an independently wealthy man, everything had to be taken from the business and reinvested. This is the first coral system that we had. It was an original idea of mine to uh, make a long trough. These are two 40-foot troughs. And I thought, well, if we recirculate, instead of having tanks where it just recirculates in a tight circle, if the water w moved in a long direction down the troughs, uh, the corals will do better. And so this type of holding system is now copied in almost every warehouse in, in the world because it works. Um, the corals did well. Um, in the beginning, the technology, you're, you're going back to like 1996 right now. Um, all we had were these metal halides that were hanging from the ceiling. These are 400 watt bulbs. We really didn't get much um, value out of them, but it did provide light. We were able to see at night, basically. Um, so our job was to keep moving the corals as fast as we could to the market. Um, this eventually evolved into this. So now we own over 300 of these fixtures over all of our rows. And uh, we've also improved a lot on our systems. Um, those two rows went to three rows, and then it continued to expand. But um, we found that the better you can keep your livestock at the point of origin, the better it's going to ship, the healthier it's going to be. And um, as you see, our live, this is our soft coral system. We have a total of five different systems in the building. They all cater to the different needs of the animals that we hold in them. And then we have the task of training locals. There is no aquarium industry in Fiji. That you can't go to any store anywhere in Fiji and buy an aquarium. So these people think I'm crazy catching these little fish that you can't eat. But uh, the locals soon learned that you know they could uh, have employment, uh, pretty steady employment, and they learn a new trade. And uh, they're putting all these things in bags. They've never done anything like this before. But you'll be surprised. Um, how quickly uh, the island people learn because they need employment and they, they don't want to lose their job. So they, they learn and they work very diligently to, to keep what they've learned moving along. Um, we train them in the technique of planting coral. Uh, in this particular photo, you're seeing how we plant the coral in the warehouse. First, we leave it sit for a day. Uh, Cameron B., our, our, uh, you might have seen his talk yesterday, will show a lot, has showed a lot of these these photos, he's my livestock manager, my farm manager, he's, he's sitting here as well. And um, this is what a frag from Fiji starts out looking like. Um, I know you see a lot of things downstairs that don't quite look that big, but um, this is the first day before we plant them. And this is the final product. This is about three months, three months on the farm. And um, these are some of the sizes of the, of the coral frags that you can get from Fiji on a regular basis. Um, and then this is one of the guys, 
I believe that's, that's planting, right? That's not harvesting. That's bringing it, yeah, that's bringing it to the racks that are uh, down on the, uh, on, you know, down maybe eight feet of water, 12 feet of water, depending on what we're growing. And I would venture to say today we have a little over 100,000 pieces of coral on five different farm sites in Fiji. And as you can see, we do all kinds of different varieties. We're actually experimenting with a lot more variety. This, this video was taken a little while ago, but we have a lot more varieties now that we're finding. We're getting the echinata and we're experimenting with the different, um, you know, large polyps and stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, a, it's a learning experience even for us. And we are, after all, hobbyists. We just operate on a slightly different level, but uh, we're hobbyists. So... And then, while we were, while we were just, um, developing the technique of, of um, doing coral farming, which, by the way, in 19, that started in 1998, and that was the first commercial coral farm in the world, um, we got the idea from the hobby itself because we heard that people were starting to do this in their tanks, and I said, well, let's try it commercially. Let's see if we can supply this because it's certainly a good thing. Um, so we've been, like I said, we've been doing that for the last 16 years in Fiji. Now, uh, at the same time, I said, well, if we can do this with coral, we could probably do it with rock as well. So we start, I started experimenting with taking cement and trying to make it look like rock and put it in the ocean and see what, you know, how it's going to develop, how long it will take to become live rock. And uh, it went from what you saw on those, on those little tables over there to having something like this available. And now the, we have the task of trying to get this into the sea. What you're looking at there is 40 tons of, of man-made live rock. And this, this picture was just taken last year. And um, we found that, you know, trying to get this out to sea was kind of cost pr prohibitive because you can only put so much on these small boats that we used, and it's a lot of fuel. Fuel is very expensive in Tonga. So we, uh, what we decided is to let it collect until we had enough to hire this barge. Now, the barge can take um, 40 tons, so that's what we did. And then we went out to the reef. And we GPS the spot, and we put it all, in, uh, held it all on the reef. A lot of that is still there today. Now, through all of this live rock and everything else, guess what came last in Fiji? Fish. This is our fish system. All the time you saw all that other work going on, this building remained empty uh, because, uh, as I said earlier, we were saving it for fish. And of course, those tanks aren't available in Tonga. I mean, I'm Fiji. Where am I today? I'm in Fiji. Okay. And we had a, uh, so what we had to do is go to my manufacturer in the U.S., in L.A., and say, and with drawings and say, this is going to be my fish system. I want you to build it and ship it to me. And, of course, we deal, deal with a lot of um, fish that are territorial, that fight. So most of the, fi most of the system is built up with uh, cubicles. And you're looking at about 3,000 cubicles and some big tanks to hold the, the fish that could, you know, uh, community fish that could swim well together. And we used the, the basic technology of live rock, because I, I knew where to get live rock, didn't have to import that in, and sand filters. And that was our first fish system. And then the coral system started to develop where we, re, we replaced the tanks that we first got. And now 100% of the coral system is all held in, in uh, long troughs like you see there. And we also experimented a little bit with bringing in stuff from other countries. We're not allowed to do that anymore because of biodiversity issues and biosecurity, but um, we were bringing in some, a lot of croceas in from my friend up in the Solomon Islands, and because the flight came through Fiji anyway, uh, so we tried that for a while, and um, it didn't work, didn't work out so well because the, at that time the clam market was so competitive. Uh, they were coming from everywhere, and it, it just, just didn't make any sense for us to do that. Um, and this is, these are the, uh, some of the latest tanks that we installed. These are troughs that we just recently bought uh, in LA a couple of years ago. And what this is, is the divers tanks. When they come in at night uh, with their catch, they, each one has his own tank. And we're able to put these in, all the corals in these separate tanks. And in the morning, our crew counts them because they're all paid by the piece. Every diver is paid by the piece of what he catches. And we count them and we grade them. And if they're no good, if they've made mistakes in the collection, we give them to that diver to take back to the reef. 
And of course, we live in paradise. And in paradise, stuff happens. And when it rains hard, uh, this happens. Now this again goes right along with the cyclones, goes right along with the heavy rains that we get. Sometimes it rains for a month. And um, our main town that we, that we happen to live near, is it, it, it's kind of like the New Orleans thing. It's in a basin and it just floods every time it rains. But a few years ago, um, we got the idea um, I had been working on this for a few years, but we finally were able to put it into action in 2011 um, where we went from Latoka, which you see on the big island on the bottom where the airplane is, is where our facility is, to all the way at the top where you see Great Sea Reef. That's, that town is called Lombasa, even though you don't see the M, believe me, it's there. Um, that's 400 miles. And we we went up there on a survey and we, we took a look at some of the fish and said, you know, Fiji is, our, our station is not known as a fish company. We're known as Coral and Rock because the fish that, our whole collection station, the see where you see Waya, W-A-Y-A, -A, uh, up to Naviti, that was our collecting area. And we didn't have any centropagies, we didn't have any angels, we just had normal common fish, bread and butter, Fiji damsels, some sailfin tangs here and there but nothing really substantial. And I had this big fish system with no fish in it. So when we went up there in 2011 and we discovered that the varieties are there, um, it was very interesting for us to try to, de to develop that. But what we didn't know is that the Northern Island is completely different than the South Southern Island. And they're a bit more primitive. So I brought this, most of you probably know Bob Fenner. He came, he came along for that trip, and he helped me build the system up in Lombasa after we proved that the, the, everything was there that we needed. And so that system actually came from Tonga because I closed down Tonga in 2010. It just became too difficult to deal with the government in Tonga being, living in Fiji. So Bob helped us for a few weeks. It took us, I think, two and a half weeks to build this system up, up north. And... Um, we had, but, we, what, but in order to catch the fish, we had to bring in foreign divers because nobody up north had any idea how to catch fish and I wasn't gonna go about trying to train a whole new staff um, in the art of hand catching fish. So today we employ eight Filipino divers. We house them, feed them, and pay them a salary and send some of their money to the Philippines to, pay their fam to, to support their families. And these guys are expert uh, catch what they call Netsmen. They have went through the Netsmen training program. Um, we absolutely refused to uh, hire any divers that would use uh, harmful drugs or um, you know, cyanide, dynamite, the things that they sometimes do use. And sometimes they work in teams. Um, and these guys are really expert and you won't believe the, the numbers of fish they bring in for us every day. And why do we have to hire Filipinos um, when there actually are divers there that we could possibly train. And does anybody know what this is? Well, at, in some places of the world, they actually eat that stuff. And they call it a delicacy. It's called bitch demir, and it's a sea cucumber. And it's a, basically a Chinese trade. And the Chinese uh, exporters that are up there in Lombasa pay $70 a kilo for that stuff. Does that look appetizing to anybody here? Yeah, to me, I, I got a name for it. It's what comes out of the back end of a dog. But anyway, um, a diver was not gonna, a, a local diver was not gonna come to me and say, yes, I want a job with you and you can pay me a dollar a fish when I'm getting about $70 or $80 a, uh, you know, for one of those. And all you have to do is swim down and pick it up off the bottom. So that was my competition in trying to get employment. And in explaining that to the government, uh, they realized that, um, you know, yes, you have a problem. The, the locals won't work for you. Uh, so they allowed us to bring in expats, uh, you know, to catch the fish. And uh, one of the holy grails in that area, we were hoping to find blue tangs, and we did. Uh, blue tangs at that particular point in, in time were extremely rare in the industry. For some reason, they had vanished in Indonesia and the Philippines, and all my, all my um, customers were begging us to you know, find blue tangs. We don't find them every day, but when we do, we find a lot of them. 
and everybody got in the act. Now, I, I told you a minute ago that Lombasa Station is, is 400 miles away. So the only way to get the fish down is by boat. There's no airplanes that will carry the fish. The airplanes carry 16 people, and that's it. So to make a shipment of the fish that we're catching from the north, we have to bring them on boat, and it's over 20-some hours to get to our facility in, in Latoka. So everybody gets in the act. That's my, there's my wife, Deb. She's so happy to see fish coming in. She's, she's down there all the time. And we catch a lot of angels up there. So we had to build acclimation systems to hold the se angels separately so they didn't tear each other to shreds while we were uh, bringing them into the system. And one of the reasons we were able to do that is we made a deal with the people up there that we are going to teach you the art of coral farming. We're going to give you a coral farm, all the infrastructure, we're going to give you the training, and we're going to train you how to catch, or not catch, plant a thousand pieces of coral a month, 500 of which we will buy, and 500 of which you will replant back on the reef to increase the size of your habitat. So our little team went up there and we dealt with a couple of different villages that were, wanted to do this. And for that, we got the right to fish in their water for tropical fish. Because in, in Fiji, it's all done on a, what they call a, a goli goli system which means the chief owns that water out there, and you have to deal with the village in order to just snorkel in that water, let alone take anything out. So Cameron is up there now showing the villagers, you know, exactly what it is that we have been doing down in the north for many years. And surprisingly enough, the, the ladies also just loved it. They got into the act big time, and I always thought the ladies would be, you know, good at this kind of job. So um, we're teaching them how to plant a thousand corals a month, and of course, you live in paradise, things happen, cyclones come along, so there are setbacks that come back and forth. But by and all, it's a pretty good program up there. Um, they, they, plant the, they, they do the fragging on, on the shore, and then they bring it out to the reef. Now, one of the other things that we do in Tonga, I mean in Fiji, I'm sorry, I keep saying Tonga, I've been out of there for a long time. But anyway, we can entertain up to about 24 schools or more per month. It's become a very popular uh, place for schools to bring their buses. We make sure they come while we're not packing because there's a hundred or more kids running through the place slapping on tanks and everything. And they have a wonderful time. One of our marine biologists on staff uh, escorts them around and explains things about sea life. An interesting story about that is um, a few years ago when we were getting this cor coral farming uh, idea in the north going, uh, a marine biologist from the University of South Pacific applied for a job. And we said, yeah, you'd, you'd be good for the coral farm project. So I put him and Cameron together. And uh, he was working in the north to, you know, to help the villagers, because it's good to have a, a, a Fijian uh, help with that job, because uh, a lot of them don't speak English. So about three weeks later, he came to me and he says, you know, you know why I wanted a job here? When I was a small kid, I came here on a field trip to your facility. And I made up my mind then that I was going to study marine biology so I can get a job in your company. And uh, that was kind of a good story. And in fact, I got goose pimples right now thinking about it. So this, this, is, this is one of the benefits that Fiji gets from us. Uh, we, we have won the Exporter of the Year Award twice now. Uh, we're very large contributors to the uh, Fiji economy in, in terms of in, in import revenue for, for the export that we do. And um, we, we get along with fisheries, but there's always problems. Uh, you know, just like this thing that I've asked you to sign today, um, governments change, people in power change, and some of them have different ideas about what you're able to harvest and what you're not. So we're constantly on the guard, making sure that everybody knows how sustainable we are and that we follow best practice. So um, now I'm going to show you a little X-rated film of uh, a, a, a fish that's named after my wife. This is the Centropygi deberi. We discovered up on the same reef um, where Bruce Carlson discovered um, his Cirilibris, Cirilibris margeri. His wife's name is Marge, and those two fish, there they are, oh, close your eyes. Um, those two fish, the, the Deberi and the margeri, are only found in that one small area. And, but we also are coming across other fish. Here's a fish that I, I'm convinced is a new species. There's been other ones, identical markings, so it's not quite a variant. Um, and we're, 
we're checking it out now. We're waiting for DNA testing. It uh, should be coming along any time now. And um, if it does prove to be a new species, that's another species that the Great Barrier Reef has produced. We're convinced there's many up there. So I hope you've enjoyed that little trip. Uh, our company now from three people is up to over 300 people. And uh, we export to 26 different countries. And we live in paradise. <laughs> and work seven days a week. <laughs> so, the Naka.